Jesus' name, amen. So our scripture reading this morning is from Matthew chapter 5. We're going to be in the Beatitudes for uh, quite a while, for nine weeks. So seeing the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. And blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. This is the word of the Lord. So as we're looking at the greatest sermon ever preached, Jesus is teaching his disciples how to live as citizens of his kingdom. Now, these are not just lofty ideals, but these are you know, for, for those who have been born again, those who have the Holy Spirit living in us. The Spirit enables us to live, to strive to live in such a radical, countercultural way. So that these nine Beatitudes that we read, they start to describe who you are as a believer in Christ. Now, if you're not yet a believer, every command that we see here, every blessing we see in the Sermon of the Mount, they will describe for you what a life committed, transformed by the grace of God in Jesus Christ is like. This is not a life that you can accomplish by just trying harder and fixing yourself. No, you need Christ in your life to accomplish this. You must first repent of your sins and trust in him. And then he offers you the kingdom. Then he'll come and live and help you and transform you so you look and look more like Christ. So last week we started our Beatitude series. We looked at the the blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We looked at how this, this one who has poor in spirit has humbled himself, has recognized their great need. You know, they're unworthy to enter the kingdom of God. And in humility, they've come to Jesus. They were begging Jesus, forgive me, have mercy on me, give me grace. And Jesus promises that all who come to him with this attitude, he gives the kingdom of God. He gives salvation to those who are poor in spirit. And today we're looking at our second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, as you're listening to this, this is another one of those kind of paradoxes, one of these countercultural ideas. I mean, if you're living in the world, what could be more ridiculous than to say, blessed are those who are mourning and sad? How are they blessed? Or suggesting that true blessing and joy comes through sadness and mourning. No, this is not the wisdom of the world. I mean, ask anybody in this world, and they'll tell you where happiness and blessing come from. Well, they come from when things go your way. They come from whether you have enough money to buy happiness. They come from pleasure, praise, or, or fame, or even self-assertion, expression of yourself. That's what brings you happy. Now, negatively, some might say, you know, when you avoid hardship, when you avoid pain and difficulties and suffering, frustration or frustrated people, when you avoid troubles and the problems of life, that's what will make you happy. And I think it doesn't matter what, what society, where you go, that's kind of the universal wisdom of the world in all cultures. Yet Jesus is telling us this morning, blessed are those who mourn. Because the path to eternal happiness, the path to, to joy that is from him, comes through sadness and mourning. And this morning we're looking at four questions that to help us understand what mourning is so we can find comfort in God. Comfort uh, from godly grief because we all experience grief and hardship and we need his comfort. So here are four questions. First, what does it mean to be blessed? Second, what kind of mourning is not blessed? Uh, Third, what kind of mourning is blessed? And fourth, how do you know you're mourning in such a way that God will comfort you? So let's look at that first question. What does it mean to be blessed? 
Well, being blessed means that you are a recipient of God's goodness, his favor, his kindness, his grace. And it's also important to know that God blesses those who have repented of their sin, blesses those who have come to faith in Christ. Those outside faith, those outside Christ, do not receive God's blessing in this way. Now, certainly God is compassionate. He is loving. He's gracious and merciful to all peoples. No, and, and we see this in his common grace. But these beatitude blessings that are so countercultural, that are so unexperienced, not experienced by so many people, that doesn't fall under the grouping of common grace. No, these are blessings that come as you mourn. The blessing is that you'll be comforted. No, mourning in itself is not necessarily a blessing, but God will bless those who mourn because it's a means to receive comfort and blessing from God. Now, as we look at these Beatitudes, we see that all these blessings, they're not physical, they're not material. They're spiritual blessings. They're eternal blessings. No, they're, they're, they're uh, uh, character traits. They're attitudes that God gives to all believers, all who are mourning, all who are grieving. No, God gives now, some people think the Christian life is about happiness and joy, the absence of sorrow. But this beatitude tells us you know, that mourning, it's necessary. It's a regular part of the Christian life. It's, it's part of what it means to be a Christian, growing in Christ's likeness. There is an element of mourning in our life. So let's ask that question. What kind of mourning is blessed by God? Now, first, let's look at what is not blessed. What type of mourning is not blessed? Now, in Greek, there are nine different words that you could translate sorrow or mourning. The one in our text this morning is uh, pentheo. It is the strongest, it is the deepest, most heartfelt word that there is for sorrow and mourning. And this would be the mourning and the grief that you would experience if your spouse died or if your child died. You would be visibly weeping and wailing and in, in lament. Now, certainly, when we think of someone mourning, it's usually because someone is responding to a great loss in their life. So their heart is full of sorrow, it's full of sadness, whether it is a passing of a loved one, parent, spouse, child, friend, pet, if that's you, whether it's the loss of a job, loss of employment, or an opportunity. No, you lost your house, you lost an investment, you lost something prized to you loss of health. Now, many different things can trigger this kind of uh, misfortunate grieving of ourselves. You know, we even sometimes, it's not even us, it's other people that we love, you know, can trigger th mourning, mournful thoughts, sorrow. Now, it hurts when a loved one makes foolish decisions, harmful decisions. You know, it, it's, it's, it's hurtful when the, you have a rebellious son or daughter walking away from you. Or on the other spectrum, you have a neglectful parent. You know, these things harm you. We can also mourn when we face persecution or in response to the evil that we see around us. As I say, sorrow, grief, mourning, it's common to all people all across the world. Everyone experiences it from time to time. But as we've already stated, God doesn't just bless everybody who, who mourns. This beatitude, this blessing here is only for those who have come to faith in Christ. And that's not everyone. Not everyone who mourns over the pains and the heartaches and the sorrows of life will find comfort in God. See, if you're still alienated from God, you'll never experience the comfort, the promises that we see here in our verse until you've come to faith in Christ. You're missing out on, on God's blessing and how he comforts you in mourning, in grief. You know, also, sometimes mourning can lead you to despair. Sometimes it can lead you to sinful or even destructive behavior. Harming yourself, blaming others, blaming the Lord. God doesn't bless it when we sinfully respond in our mourning and have this kind of sinful sorrow. I think we need to go to 2 Corinthians 7, verse 10. The Apostle Paul tells us that there are two kinds of sorrow. There is a godly sorrow that brings repentance, that leads to salvation. 
and leaves no regret, but there is a worldly sorrow that brings death. Two kinds of sorrow, same word, you know, godly sorrow and worldly sorrow. Godly sorrow leading to repentance, leading to salvation, leading you to you turning away from your sin and going to God. And there's a worldly sorrow that only brings death. And the reason it brings death is because it doesn't lead you to repent, it doesn't lead you to look to God. So unless your sorrow, your mourning is godly, leading to repentance, leading to Christ, leading to you turning back to Him, it's not something that's going to be blessed. It's not a kind of mourning that is blessed by God. See, you know, sometimes, you know, people, we mourn, we, we feel bad, we go through grief when things, bad things happen to us. Or perhaps we're caught in our own sin, something we've committed. We, we don't like the consequences. Now, if that kind of doesn't lead you to recognize who you are before God and go to God, come back to Him, turn away from your sins and go to Him, that blessing, that mourning is not blessed by God. Because everybody feels bad when we get caught. Everyone feels bad that, you know, when, 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 when bad things happen to us. But if that doesn't change who you are on the inside, if, if God doesn't come into your life, you're not turning back to Him and going to Him. If, if the Spirit of God is not convicting you and showing you, you know, this sorrow might be because of me or it might be because of sin and evil outside, and I need to go back to Him. If you're not going back to Him, it's just a matter of time before you become a repeat offender in your sin. You know, you on your inside have not changed. The circumstances might have, but you haven't. I can give you an example. I got two young boys. They fight from time to time, right? And sometimes dad has to come in and step in to break it up, to do some discipline, you know, to help them to reconcile. And a part of this whole discipline process, there often are tears of sorrow, perhaps tears of anger. You know, there are, of course, some exchange of words, you know, I'm sorry, please forgive me. Let's make peace. Let's reconcile. You know, but as, as a father, you can tell is your child apologizing because they got caught and they don't want to get disciplined? Or maybe they, they're angry or, or crying because they got disciplined. You know, they're just responding because they want to avoid the punishment or the discipline, the correction that comes. And that is different than having tears of sorrow if you're, my son is crying because he hurt his brother or crying because he sinned against his father, sinned against God. Those, those, those are different kinds of tears, different kinds of sorrow. See, there is a worldly kind of sorrow that fears discipline, that fears the negative consequences of getting caught. And there is a godly kind of sorrow that produces repentance, leading to a change of mind about who you are and God. You know, so if we're going to just qualify this beatitude, what kind of mourning is blessed? Well, let's say that the godly kind of mourning, the mourning of the godly, will be comforted from every pain, every sorrow in this world. God's not blessing the sorrow that doesn't produce righteousness that turns you back to the Lord. So what kind of mourning is blessed by God then? Oh, it's a mourning that is, you know, it's Godward. It's leading to repentance. It's leading to turning back to Him. Now, this kind of mourning is a deep, intense grief over your sin before the Lord. It produces repentance, leads to salvation, leads to God giving you comfort. You, know, you mourn over your sin. You mourn over the consequences of your sin. You mourn over your fallenness before God. And that turns you to seek God. His Spirit comes and convicts your heart, saying you need to be right with Him. And, you know, this mourning isn't just focus and dwell on yourself, but it changes, it moves, it shifts you to turn to the Lord, to go to Him in prayer, to go to Him in confession and repentance so that He can remove your sin, remove your guilt. Now, in a sense, this beatitude here, this blessing is an outworking of the first beatitude, being poor in spirit. Because when you're poor in spirit, you're recognizing that you're unworthy to go to God. You're helpless, you're hopeless, you're lost before God. The next step in that process is that mourning. It's, it's turning back to God, leading to repentance, leading to the right emotion, the right response to the gospel, to God's goodness, to his love. 
I'll give you an example. You know, when John the Baptist, he was preaching repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We know all kinds of people were coming to him to be baptized. But you don't picture them, you know, coming, you know, stoically and coldly calculating, saying, yes, I'm a sinner, let's get baptized. Or I agree with all the facts that, yes, I've sinned, I need the gospel, I need to be right with God, let's go get baptized. It's not kind of the picture that we have, you know. You know, the, 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 they were coming to get baptized, publicly confessing their sin. You know, it involves weeping and mourning over their personal offense to God. You know, they're being broken by the heavy weight of their guilt. And they're coming to get mercy. They're coming to get healed. And they're coming to be right with him. See, God blesses those who mourn their sin, who are longing for forgiveness, those who want his help. When we mourn our sin, when we turn, you know, our eyes and hearts away from the evil, we go back to Jesus. He blesses us with the comfort of forgiveness of reconciliation, of being right with God. And that's the promise here. That's the the comfort is in here, that, that as we confess our sins, as we mourn over our sins, God comes and comforts us with free forgiveness that's been purchased by the blood of Christ. The comfort, the happiness, the joy, this is a real reality that God no longer holds any of your sin against you. It's wiped away, clean forever. And no amount of positive thinking can produce that in your life. You can be blessed, you can be forgiven, you can be comforted because you are forgiven, because all your sins are gone. Wiped away, washed, clean by the blood of Christ. No, you're not blessed and happy in your sin. That is incompatible with Christianity. God doesn't bless those who walk in defiant rebellion to him. Though he is loving, yes, he loves you with the gospel and offers you forgiveness, but you must come and turn from them to him to receive it. Now think about it in our culture, in our self-gratifying, pleasure-seeking culture. You ever hear any kind of mourning over sin? Does it even come up as a category anybody thinks of? Usually the message of the world is, is, the wisdom of the world is that you will be happy in your sin. You will be happy in yourself, not when you mourn. But what about the joy in God? The joy in God is, is us promises that there is real happiness, there's true blessing, there's true joy. When your sins are forgiven, when you mourn, when they are removed far from you and put onto Christ, that's when real joy in the gospel comes. The means to blessing is that you are grieve and you mourn, and that leads you to repentance. And without this, you won't be right with him. You won't be right with others in your community also. So... Long way to say, confess your sins to God. Mourn over them. Be in distress over them. Don't ignore, don't hide your guilt. Let me just ask you this, even as I was thinking about this. When is the last time that you shed Christian tears because of your sin? Because you're mourning your sin? See, sometimes we, we Christians also make so much of the love and the grace of God. We, we take it and exalt it so highly, and, and rightly so. But at times that can come at an expense of taking our sin far too lightly. You know, is there enough godly sorrow for sin among us? Is there enough godly grief and penitent hearts within his church? And as you think and you dwell upon these things, are you asking the Lord to change who you are? Not just change what you do, but change who you are on the inside. It's this whole goal of mourning is that we would turn from sin. We would receive the comfort that God gives in forgiveness as an expression of his great love for sinners. And this is true whether it's the first time you've repented of your sins, first time you've mourned them and come to Christ. This forgiveness, this comfort is yours if, if it is the very last, you know, your very last breath before you breathe your last and die and you confess, God comforts you in that. Everywhere in between, as we're growing in grace, as we're becoming more aware of who we are in our own sin, 
You know, we have much, much more to mourn for, not less. And so as we mourn our sin, we develop a greater conviction of our sin, a greater sensitivity to the evil in us and in our world. Because Christians also mourn when we see evil and an unrepentance in our world. Let me give you an example of what the, the psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 136. He says this, My eyes shed streams of tears because men do not keep thy law. My eyes shed streams, rivers of tears because men don't keep your law. The psalmist here is clearly broken. He's mourning because the people around him are breaking God's law. Now, even Jesus Christ, our Lord, he wept over the sins of others. He wept when other people, you know, received judgment because of their sin. We'll get there at some point in Matthew 11, uh, in 20 to 24, Jesus, he wept over Chorazon. He wept over the cities of Bethsaida, those regions. Because he did, did so many miracles, so many healings there. He preached the gospel, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. But they would not repent. They would not receive him as their king, their Messiah. And thus they will face judgment for hardening their hearts against him and the gospel. So Jesus mourns over their hardness of heart. No, later on in Matthew 23, 37, Jesus laments over Jerusalem, saying, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and the, the stones are sent to it. How often I would have gathered you like children, like a hen gathers her brood under her wings, protecting them from, from the judgment. But they were not willing. They weren't willing to receive him. So Jesus laments and mourns over Jerusalem because they would not receive him with repentance, with a penitent heart. They wouldn't have him as their Messiah. And those who hear the good news, those who reject Jesus Christ, are choosing judgment, they're choosing hell rather than an eternity of blessing in God's kingdom. And we don't ultimately know when people reject us or people reject Christ with that the last time. We don't know. There's always hope until they die. But Jesus Christ, he knows their hearts. He knows their choices. And he mourns the fact that so many people would rather choose hell than choose forgiveness and heaven through him. And let me ask you, when you see evil in our culture, you know, there's, there's a lot of it everywhere. There's far too much of it. You know, in our society, when people say, celebrate me, affirm me in my sin, you know, how should Christians respond? How should you respond? Maybe with anger? Maybe in ignoring it, neglecting it, distracting yourself from it? Or maybe you just go with the flow and say, okay, I'll celebrate you with a, you know, a little flag and I'll parade you and you can come out and, and, and I'll affirm you in your sin. But I think the Christian response is never celebrating sin. The Christian response is to mourn over the sin in our society. To mourn that we live in a culture that is so depraved, so, so lost and hopeless. You know, that right is wrong and wrong is right. I've seen that in my life. Now, I mean, Jesus, he mourned. Now, we should mourn, we should grieve, and then we should pray for them. Jesus mourned over the lostness and the brokenness and evil in his world. Should we, his disciples, not do the same? Should we not mourn over evil in our world? You know, before we go and denounce every evil and call sinners to repent, let us first also mourn over the brokenness and sin and depravity in our world. Let's mourn, let's pray, and then point people to Christ. Something I've been working on in my own life as well. So let's look at our last question. How do you know if mourning, you're mourning in such a way that God will comfort you? Well, the promise here is that God comforts those who mourn in a godly way. If you mourn over your sin, you, you repent of it, God will comfort you with forgiveness. And as a believer, you know, it's more than just mourning sin, but all kinds of mourning you face. The loss of a loved one, you know, going through the trials and persecutions, the looking at the evil in this world, 
all of our mourning, God will comfort and he will promise to do so. God the Father, speaking of him in 2 Corinthians 1, 3 to 4, says, The Father of all mercies and God of comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. God the Father comforts us in all our affliction. Jesus Christ the Son says later on in Revelation 21, at the end of history, says, Our Lord, he will wipe away every tear from your eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. That's what will happen when Christ returns. And we know God the Holy Spirit in John 14, he is called the helper. He is called the comforter. His job description is to comfort the saints. So we see every person of the Trinity has a role in comforting and consoling you and restoring you to happiness in Christ. He's here existing to turn your mourning into joy and endless rejoicing. So how do you know if you're mourning in a godly way? I found that John MacArthur gave three helpful steps in his commentary, so I'm just going to give those three to you, kind of elaborate on them a little bit. First, put away hindrances. Put away hindrances that distract you from mourning, things that make you content with yourself, things that cause you to doubt his word or harden your heart in sin. Hindrances like despair, thinking that, you know, it, it is so bad, I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm in such a bad place that I am beyond help. Even God can't help me and comfort me. That's despair. Hindrances like conceit, thinking that, you know, there, there's nothing really wrong with me. I'm, doing, I'm not great, but I'm okay. I, I don't need to mourn. Hindrances like presumption. No, presumption knows that you need his grace, you need his forgiveness. But you kind of cheapen his grace. You presume God will forgive you if you don't repent. You know, saying sorry is, is part of it, but saying sorry, admitting fault is not repentance. Repentance is, is turning, it's changing your mind, changing your life, going back to him. Sometimes we just say sorry and then we don't repent. You know, there are hindrances like procrastination. Now, I'm just going to put off my sin. I'm going to put off mourning. I'm just going to ignore it and it'll go away, but in reality, it just grows bigger and bigger and bigger, like a cancer growing within you. Unless you deal with it, it's still there. So put away hindrances. Secondly, yeah, MacArthur says, uh, study what sin and evil are according to the Scriptures. Look at the Word of God so you know what is evil, you know what is sin, and you know what God hates. So you can avoid it, right? Now, contrary to what we may think, ignorance of sin is not bliss, it's not blessing. Because the, yet, though, as the more and more you're aware of what God hates, that's going to help you and stop sinning in ignorance. Then you can mourn, then you can grieve, then you can repent and find the blessing that is and the comfort in God and give Him the glory for it. A third, he says, pray for God to give you a broken and contrite heart. You know, a humble, mournful heart that leads to repentance. That's a blessing that God gives. It's something we need to ask for, and God answers our prayers. So if you do these three things, you put away hindrances, you study the scripture and what it says on sin, you ask and pray for a contrite heart, Well, how do you know, if you've done all that, whether you're mourning in the way that God commands? Well, maybe some diagnosis questions you can think about. Are you more sensitive to sin? Do you mock? Do you laugh? Do you take it lightly? Do you enjoy sin? Do you have real sorrow over your sin? Not just because I got caught, not just because, you know, there there are, are negative consequences, but I'm sorrowful because my sin has affected, has harmed God's reputation and harmed his glory. You know, do, do you take heart you know, when you hear of a brother, sister falling into sin? You know, does that cause you to grieve? You know, do you take heed lest you fall? You know, when you turn on the evening news and you listen and watch all the, the evils and the harm and the negative things in the world of our breaking news, does that cause you to grieve? Does that cause you to really grieve over the sins of our world? 
You know, have you experienced God's release, the release and the freedom of being free from guilt and sin, knowing you have been forgiven? You know, have you experienced that guilty conscience? God. Have you experienced the happiness, the blessing of God's comfort? You know, as you're thinking through some of these questions, I know I'm praying, I'm hoping that you're saying, yes, I have. I'm praying that these yeses would be more and more frequent also in your life as you grow in grace. But if you're saying no to most or all of these questions, friend, there's a good chance that you don't have a saving relationship with Christ. And if that's you, you know, you need to confess your sins. You need to acknowledge them. You need to mourn over sin. Repent, turn away from them, recognizing that my sin has separated me from God and all his blessing. Repent of them, turn away, and trust in Jesus who loved you, who loves you, who died for you, who, who lived for you, who rose to life to give you new life so that you can have blessing, you can have the comfort of God and know his forgiveness. You can have that release from all the guilt that you've been storing up for, and for your sin your whole life. And come to Jesus and find comfort for your weary soul. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for you know, this, this message, how it's so weighty upon our hearts. I'm thankful for how it just so challenges me. And as I think through my own sin, as I think through and, you know, emotionally go through this morning process when I see sin around us in our world, in our society, in our church, Lord, help us to grieve in such a way that brings you honor. Help us to grieve in such a way that leads us to repent and turn away and go back to you and find comfort and forgiveness in you. Lord, make it true of us that we are people who, you know, are not more righteous than thee or righteous than thou, but break us, Lord, so when we present the good news of the gospel, when we present the love of Christ, it will be from a broken and contrite spirit. It will be one who has experienced the forgiveness of God. So we can really point people to see the greatness of the love of Christ in his death for us. I pray in you and make this true of us. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.